All right, guys, so in this video, we're gonna talk about kind of the last consideration in getting prepped for our workflow, which is basically to set up Lightroom and to set up our software correctly. So we're gonna talk about our uh, general preferences, catalog settings, and even go into a couple of Lightroom hacks and tweaks to get it running even faster. So let's get started in this video. We're gonna cover our general preferences first, and we can get there by hitting Control, comma, or that's Command, comma, on a Mac. And let's see, there we go. Okay, so once we're in our preferences, we're going to go through this pretty quickly because once again, you guys already have a good Lightroom foundation. We're just going to specifically cover kind of these different settings that affect overall workflow and things that you guys want to look out for. Now, the first thing I want to do is want to have this automatically check for updates selected. The reason why is you want Lightroom, uh, at least on every time you open up Lightroom, you want to be able to check to make sure if there are any new updates available. These new updates will not only fix bugs, they're also going to add uh, additional compatibility with new raw formats and things like that. So it's something that you want to frequently check for. Next, with the default catalog, I like to have this set to load most recent catalog. And the reason being is that typically when I'm opening and closing Lightroom, I want to open the last catalog I was working on until I'm finished. And then I start up a new catalog just from my file system itself, just by loading it directly from there. So I have this on load most recent so I can kind of continue working where I left off. Now in the import options, I have show import dialog when a memory card is detected, deselected. And the reason why is because Basically, if you plug in a hard drive or a pen drive or CF card, SD cards, whenever Lightroom detects that there's images on an external drive that was recently plugged in, with this option selected, it's gonna pull up the import dialog, which means that if you're not in Lightroom, it's gonna load Lightroom, and then it's gonna pull up the import dialog. This can be really annoying when you're working another program or even when you're working in Lightroom and this kind of interrupts your workflow. So I'd recommend that you guys leave that deselected. Now going down, if you guys shoot RAW plus JPEG, uh, you typically want to have this selected. Treat JPEG files next to RAWs as separate photos. If you don't, then it's only going to import the RAW file and it's not going to import the JPEG. Typically if you're shooting RAW plus JPEG, it's because you want to use those JPEGs for some sort of kind of quick turnaround type process. Uh, and so you would want to have Lightroom import those JPEGs so you have it right next to the RAW files as well. Otherwise, you only get one. Now, since we don't do that, we're gonna leave this turned off in our workflow. Everything else is fine in the import options. Let's go down to completion sounds. Now, in the completion sounds, we always have uh, both our completion sounds selected for finishing importing as well as finishing exporting. And the reason why is because sometimes importing and exporting are long processes. You don't wanna sit there at the computer or you don't wanna sit in front of Lightroom and just wait for Lightroom to complete. So if we set this to any sound, you guys can choose any sound you want, it really doesn't matter, but set this to some sort of sound so that when Lightroom finishes importing or finishes exporting, it'll let you know by, by playing that sound and that way you know to either come back to your computer and start the next process or you know to switch back to Lightroom if you're working in another application. Now our catalog settings is the last important option in this general tab, but because the catalog settings are specific to each catalog, we're gonna cover that in the next video. So let's move on and go to the presets tab. All right, now the first two options in our default develop settings, I always have deselected. Apply auto tone adjustments and apply auto mix when first converting to black and white. You don't really want Lightroom ever guessing what you want because typically it's guessing wrong. So having it apply auto tone adjustments for default develop settings is not generally a good thing. Same thing with the uh, Lightroom black and white conversion. It doesn't usually get it right, and we're gonna set up our own presets for color uh, importing and for black and white conversion as well. So we're not gonna need these at all. So deselect those two. These next two options are really kind of specific to your studio and your workflow. If you guys find that you like to set up specific defaults to a certain camera serial number or a certain camera ISO setting, then you guys can select these and use them. Now, because we use our own preset system, even though we are a multi-camera studio, we don't generally use these uh, default develop settings specific to camera serial or camera ISO. We just use the presets that we, that we create, basically. All right, so let's go down to the next option, which is location. You wanna make sure that you turn this off. So do not select store presets with catalog. If you have this selected, all of your presets that we're creating are gonna be specific to each catalog, meaning when you open up a new catalog, your presets are all gone again. Okay, so make sure that you deselect this option. All right, that's it for the presets tab. Let's go on to the external editing tab. Now, editing in Photoshop is beyond the scope of this DVD, but we do wanna talk about kind of the optimal settings for when we do want to edit in Photoshop. Now, with uh, the file format, we do leave it as defaulted as PSD. It's totally fine right there. If you prefer TIFF, that's fine. There's not really that big of a difference between the two. 
Now with color space, because Lightroom's color space is actually ProPhoto RGB, we select the same thing for when we're going into PSDs, uh, when we're going into Photoshop. That way we have an equal color representation, and typically there's only very slight differences between the two, but we want our images to look exactly the same between the two applications. So I'd recommend you guys stick to ProPhoto RGB. sRGB is really designed for more of web output, but for some reason it kind of defaults to that. All right, so bit depth, we can leave this at eight or 16. I'm gonna select 16, and here's the difference. If you select 16, you're gonna get basically the, the best color detail uh, from your images when going from Lightroom to Photoshop. Now with 8-bit, you're gonna get the most compatibility once you're in Photoshop and using certain kind of programs and plugins. Now, there's not a huge difference between 8 and 16-bit. In fact, for most of you, when you guys go and print, you won't even be able to tell the difference. So for a lot of you, 8-bit just is totally fine because it's going to work with every single effect and plug-in and everything natively inside of Photoshop. As 16 bits, it's going to preserve additional color detail, but files will be larger. And when you want to use a certain effect that's only compatible with 8-bit, Photoshop is going to make you convert back to 8-bit before you can use those effects and plugins. So just know that you know if you guys use effects and plugins, a lot of them are not 16-bit compatible. So we'll leave it on 16-bit because we don't use a lot of additional plugins or effects and stuff like that. But just know that there's not a huge practical difference between those two options, meaning that when it goes to print, whether it's 8-bit or 16-bit, for the most part, you're not going to be able to tell the difference unless you're, say, printing huge billboard type stuff. Uh, then you'd want to definitely be in 16-bit to preserve as much detail as possible. All right, so let's go on to resolution. With resolution, you have printers that range from 240 to 300 pixels, so we leave it at 300 pixels per inch just to be safe. Um, web resolution is 72 pixels, so if you have this at 72 pixels and then you're bringing things into Photoshop, basically they're gonna be shrunk down to web resolution, and when you go to print, they're gonna come out all pixelated. So whenever we're going in Photoshop, leave it as at 300. That's the most safe option regardless of what type of print format you're going to. All right, if you need to set up an additional external editor, you're going to do the exact same thing. Just choose which editor you want, choose the exact same file formats and everything like that, uh, and so on. Now, one other option that we want to select just for the ease of our workflow is stack with original. And that's basically going to take this Photoshop file or the external edited file, and it's going to stack it with the original file that we had in Lightroom so that they're basically right next to each other. Otherwise, it's going to show up you know, somewhere else in the catalog. You're not going to be able to find it because it could be sorting based on file name or whatever. We want to stack that with the original so we can get back to it quickly. All right, so let's move on to the file handling tab. All right, now in the file handling tab, the most important thing here is the camera raw cache settings. Now with the camera raw cache settings, the first thing is you wanna set the location to your fastest internal hard drive. Uh, generally, we don't wanna use external hard drives because as we mentioned before when we're talking about hardware, using an external hard drive is gonna mean that it's wired through either USB 2 or USB 3 or Firewire which are all slower than basically having a, a, a hard drive attached directly to your motherboard. So we wanna select an internal drive. The only exception to this is if you have very fast drives that connect through like external SATA connections or, or eSATA. But in general, if you guys just stick to an internal hard drive and stick with your quickest hard drive, you'll be good for this setting. So for us, we run uh, two SSDs on every computer. So we have an SSD for, it's a solid state drive for the operating system and we have a solid state drive for our working drive. So when we have the option, we wanna choose the fastest internal drive that's not the operating system drive. So here we have selected our D drive, which is not the operating system. So operating system is the C drive. We have selected our work in progress drive, which is our D drive, which is another SSD. And then we just created a folder called 00LRC for Lightroom cache. And that's where all of our Lightroom cache files go. So just know, set it to the fastest drive possible. If you have a secondary drive that's as fast or quicker than your operating system drive, then use that drive for your Lightroom cache. Now, next thing is your maximum size of your Lightroom raw cache. Now, what you wanna do is you basically wanna set this maximum size for your camera raw cache folder to a size that's equivalent to your average event or your average shoot or whatever that may be. So if, if let's say you do are a portrait photographer and your typical shoot has say 300 images and the average camera raw cache size for one image is 10 megabytes, then you'd wanna set at least three gigabytes for your camera raw cache folder. Now, I always say include a little buffer in there. So take your three gigabytes and add like say double the amount for you know just a, a little buffer. 
If you are an event or wedding photographer like we are, then you're gonna need a much larger camera raw cache folder setting. So we typically will come back from a wedding with around three to 4,000 images. So three to 4,000 images times 10 megabytes per photo for that raw preview size is gonna be around 30 to 40 gigabytes. We take that and we add say 10 gigabytes, we take 40 gigabytes, add 10 just to be safe, and we come out with 50 gigabytes. The goal of this is to have your entire job. So let's say we have our entire catalog all loaded into our camera raw cache. This is gonna make it so when you're moving from image to image and you're developing, it's gonna go very quickly. If we have say 5,000 images in our catalog and our camera raw cache is only say five gigabytes, then at any point in time, we can only store say four to 500 image previews inside of that camera raw cache folder, which means that when we go to images that don't have previews generated, Lightroom will have to generate those previews as we go and move through those images, which is gonna make Lightroom pause and wait for it to generate those previews. So given how cheap hard drives are these days, you guys can afford to allocate a lot of space to this camera raw cache folder. Whether it's 10, 50, or say 100 gigabytes, you guys will need to decide on what is adequate based on your typical workflow. All right, so that's it for the file handling tab. Let's go on to the interface tab. Now in the interface tab, there's a few important things here that we want to discuss when it comes to workflow. Number one is actually the background and secondary window fill colors. Now I know this doesn't sound important, but I would typically leave your fill colors set to medium gray, which is the default. And the reason for this is if you set it to white or to black, uh, it's going to do kind of tweaky things with your eyes and it's going to make you come out with weird settings for exposure when it comes to when you come to developing your images. For example, if you set your main window background to white, then you're going to be seeing a lot of bright area around the images, which is going to tend to make you want to basically make your images darker. So once you look on your images, like when it comes out of print, you're going to find that a lot of them are going to be a little bit underexposed because you were kind of compensating for the border being completely white. Again, if you go to black or even dark gray, you're going to do the opposite and you're going to overcompensate by making images too bright. So leaving on the default medium gray is great because it's going to allow us to focus on the image's natural colors and exposure rather than being affected kind of by the background fill color of choosing different colors. All right, guys, so let's move on and let's go down to the film strip. Now, a lot of these are just kind of preferential things. Let's go over the ones that are not preferential that I would highly recommend, and that is actually in the tweaks. Uh, number one is zoom click point to center. This actually comes default deselected. You want to select this because what it's going to allow you to do is when you zoom into an image, rather than just zooming in right directly to the center of the image, it's going to zoom into where you clicked. So that way, if you want to zoom into the eyes, you just click the eyes. Otherwise, if you click on an image, it's going to default just zoom to the center of the image. So keep this as zoom click point to center. Use that, uh, keep that selected. Now that was the most important option here. The other ones are really kind of more uh, preferential options. With the show badges and show photo info tooltips, I typically have these deselected. Now I use ratings and picks as well as I wanna see when images are stacked. So I have these options selected. If you guys use badges, you can also have these options selected as well. It's really just kind of up to you and what you guys like in your workflow as these won't make much difference when it comes to efficiency. All right guys, that's it for our general preferences. Let's go on to the next video.